go ahead and get started this evening. Our first song is going to be number 652. And we're going to sing the first, third, and last verse. So that's the first, third, and last verse. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the seas and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle's try. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death an endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations all rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Before our scripture reading and opening prayer, let's turn to number 622. 622. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out. Bring it out. It will give them courage to Tonight's scripture reading will come from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Opportunity to worship, to lift our hearts together in song and in prayer, to hear another message from your word. We pray, Father, that our hearts will be open to thy divine truth. We'll be moved and motivated to respond to it, to obey it, 
to be a blessing not only for ourselves, but for our family and friends, and to those with whom we come in contact daily. We ask, Father, for the forgiveness of sin, that we may accept, that you'll accept our worship today with clean hands and pure hearts. We pray, Father, for our nation. We pray for the church here. We pray for our community. We pray for ourselves, Father, that we'll be more devoted and more dedicated to living the Christian life. We ask for forgiveness of sin in our life. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us, care for us, continue to love us. May we be influenced greatly by your word daily as we strive to live faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. For our lesson, let's turn to number 643. Number 643, and we'll sing the first and last verse. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the harvest Maybe you've noticed that you don't really see a lot of Krispy Kreme commercials on television. You ever wonder about that? I mean, we all know there's Krispy Kreme. We all know exactly where they are, but you hardly ever see any commercials for Krispy Kreme on TV. They don't even need any advertising. They don't need any PR. They're just so good that you know where they are and you have to go get it whenever you see one. And sometimes you'll even make a special trip just to be there. I think that really helps us to understand and appreciate one of the secrets to church growth. If we could think for a minute, what makes churches to grow? What makes churches grow? If you were to Google that, you'll find a whole lot of different answers. You'll find a lot of different suggestions, but I think mostly it boils down to people who love the Lord, love people, and want to help other people to get in contact with that God that they love so much. In our Great Commission passage, we are told to go and make disciples. Jesus said that we're to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. We're to go preach the gospel to every creature. And as we are out there making those disciples, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then we are to continue to teach them all of the things that Jesus has taught. You see, this is what we are supposed to be doing. And we know that if we're going to do that, we have to build relationships. Build relationships with people so that they want to hear us so that they're willing to hear us, and also, and here's the big one, so that we have people to talk to. That's huge, isn't it? I mean, most everyone sitting here in this room tonight could talk to someone about Jesus. Now, you're going to be a little bit afraid maybe the first 10, 20 times. You're going to be a little bit nervous. But everyone in here could tell someone about Jesus. You could tell other people about how you obeyed the gospel. The trick is... How do we get those people to listen? 
How do we get a relationship where we are comfortable enough to talk to other people about the gospel? I want you to hold that question in your mind while we go just a little bit further and you think about this history of growth and decline that we have seen in these United States. Everyone that's been alive for any time at all can know, can say by experience, that things just aren't the way that they were. Things are different now than they were just 20 years ago, just 10 years ago, just five years ago. But go with me back all the way back to the days when the pilgrims and Mary Grisham arrived here in this country. <laughs> he looked like he was napping a little bit. Uh, but go back to when the pilgrims arrived here in this soon-to-be country. They were fleeing for religious freedom. They didn't want to be Anglicans anymore. They didn't want to be subservient to the Church of England. Instead, they wanted to have the opportunity to worship as they saw appropriately. But after that great revival, after that great movement, we go a little bit further and what we find is the rise of deism and then religious liberalism. This really takes place about the time of the founding of these United States. Many of our founding fathers were deists. Now, I need to stop and define that word. A deist is someone who believes that God exists, that God created the world, but that God doesn't have anything else to do with the world. That's deism. That there is a God, God created the world, but God doesn't have anything at all to do with the world. So a lot of folks at this time began to give in to this idea of deism. It's really helpful when you're trying to deal with the problem of evil if you're a deist. Because you can say, well, God doesn't get involved. And so, of course, bad things happen to relatively good people. But that's not a problem for God because God just doesn't get involved. I don't think that's biblical on any account. But we also see the rise of religious liberalism. This starts really in Germany as there are a group of academics who do not believe the Bible is inspired by God. They believe that our Bibles are human documents that have been put together over several centuries. And so this German liberalism becomes a fad. It becomes what is popular. It becomes what all the smart people believe. And so the folks over at Harvard and Yale, even though they, these institutions were created by people who believed in the Bible and were originally founded to be schools of preaching, places like Harvard and Yale, because they are where the smart people are and wanted to fit in where the rest of the smart people were, they began also to teach that the Bible was not inspired. These Ivy League schools in the Northeast began to teach that the Bible was just a human document. And so, as things do, that liberalism, that the Bible is not God's Word, it began to trickle down from the Northeast throughout the rest of the country. In fact, if you'll look back into the days of the Civil War, you'll see this interesting picture of our brother David Lipscomb that was published. And the picture is of Brother Lipscomb trying to sweep back this ocean coming from the north. And it was an ocean of liberalism that began really with the idea that the Bible is not inspired. And so you have this rise of deism and religious liberalism, and then the spiritual zeal that gave way to the frontier, the wild, wild west, places far west like Missouri. Uh, but these individual places, of course, were wild because there wasn't a lot of law and order there. There weren't a lot of preachers there. There weren't a lot of congregations there. And there were a lot of men who went out and were able to do whatever they wanted, and they felt like they had no consequence. And so we see a lot of trouble coming about in that way. Because when people have anonymity and accessibility to the wrong thing, of course, that's immediately what we want to do. The spiritual zeal then gave way to the frontier until in the 1800s and 1900s, a revivalism began to sweep across the country. The greatest of these revivals began in August with the Cane Ridge Revival. 
Many of you have heard about this, but it was begun by Barton W. Stone and others who really just began wanting to have a, an observance of the Lord's Supper with all the different Christians in that particular area. And they had advertised it and thought they might get about a hundred people. But before that could happen, Brother Stone wanted to get married first. And so he had a little extra time to do some advertising and to get the word out. And by the time the uh, date arrived for the Cane Ridge meeting, communion service, there were over 10,000 people that had gathered in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And that revival lasted for several Several days. The largest and most important revival still yet in this country. But revivalism like that continued. That's why you'll still hear about camp meetings, revivals, and why you'll still see folks out under a tent preaching. They're trying to go back to Cane Ridge. They're trying to capture that same sort of spirit. And so it was from Cane Ridge up into the what's called the Azusa Street revivals in the early 1900s. You see these great camp meetings where people would come and listen to the gospel for hours. It was in part because they wanted to hear the gospel. But secondly, if you're at home and it's dark and you don't have electricity and you don't have your phone and you don't have the internet, what else have you got to do? but to go hear the preacher, to go see the crowd, to join, go enjoy people in town. And so revivalism was good in a lot of ways, but it was most effective for drawing a crowd because the crowd had nothing else to do, I'm afraid. But then we also had the Civil War. And the Civil War was incredibly divisive for this country, of course, but it was also incredibly divisive for religious people and for churches of Christ. Up until the time of the Civil War, there was a bit more union, a bit more unity before, but then after, there was a definite division. There was a definite division that resulted from a lot of things happening at that time, but you have a lot more liberal movement in the North, mainly because of the influence of those Ivy League schools, and a much more conservative movement in the South, that is really in, given in part to men like David Lipscomb uh, and working with the Gospel Advocate and some other conservative schools that were established here in the South to try to preserve conservative ideals and belief in the Bible. But then as we go after the Civil War, from the 1900s on, you see that religion begins to take hold as people look for decency and respectability. They want to have something nice. They want to appear nice. And so once again, you find people going back into churches. Religion becomes important. Church becomes important because people want to be dignified. And it's at this time that what we call cultural Christianity takes hold. That it is the cultural thing in this country to be a Christian. After all, we are a Christian nation, and if you want to get the best jobs, you've got to go to the best church. And if you want to be considered for advancement in the community, then you've got to go to church and be seen as a Christian person. That rise of cultural Christianity. Friends, that most certainly is not the case any longer, is it? Things have greatly changed. This is due in part, I think, due to some major philosophical revolutions that happened during this time. You'll probably remember Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am. And this is helpful philosophically as an exercise, but what it really does is to root the foundation of knowledge in your own thinking. So that no longer can we say that things actually exist, that they really exist, but instead now, we know things are true because we think them to be true. You see how different that is? That we begin to think that things are true because we think things are true. If we think the sky is blue, then the sky is blue. If we think it's orange, then it's orange. If we think that we are a Krispy Kreme donut, hey, if that's your experience, go for it. Now that's pretty extreme, but it's not far from experience today, is it? You see how all these things are happening? We also see Darwinian evolution taking hold. That all life just came from matter over billions and billions of years. Now, if all life just came from matter, then we are all the same stuff. 
And there really is no hierarchy of, tra- of creation. And we are just creatures. All of us. We're just here. In fact, it's not really right to speak of us as creatures in this way. In this way, when Darwinian evolution really takes hold, we're just part of the world. Just like the plants, just like the trees, just like the other animals. And we're not any better than they are. And there's really no source of morality. It's just the way we all got together and decided to live over time. Perhaps the biggest one, the biggest issue that we're dealing with today, though, is this Freudian liberation, which taught that absolutely all restraints have to be revealed, especially all sexual restraints have to be removed, I'm sorry, have to be removed, so that the individual can live life to his or her truest. There can be absolutely no restraint. You have to be able to satisfy yourself however you wish in order to truly be a person. So then it is wrong to say that someone should not live, act, identify a certain way, because if you say it's wrong, then you are restricting their becoming a true person, experiencing humanity to its fullest. Friends, this is where we are. This is our current situation. I do not think that our current situation is as bad as some would have us to think. But it is certainly not what we want it to be. It is true that 43% of just about every community in the country is now unchurched. That means that they did not grow up in church and do not identify with the congregation. About 43% of every community. Just about 10 years ago, I was really surprised whenever I had invited a guest preacher to come here to this building. And he was driving around town, probably because I'm bad at giving directions, but he was driving around town trying to find out where is the Ripley Church of Christ. And no one knew. He stopped in gas station after gas station after gas station. Where's the Ripley Church of Christ? Can't help you. Don't know. Now that seems odd, doesn't it? It's one of the biggest buildings in Tippecanoe County. How is it that no one knows where it is? Well, part of it is that 43% of our community is unchurched. Now, I did a little internet research, as whatever helpfulness that might be or may not be, and here's a summary of what I found. That if you look for what makes for a growing congregation, these are some of the things that I found listed over and over again. Number one is always relational leaders. Leaders that are out there, visible, can be seen, they're dependent upon, and you know them. Relational leaders. But then there's also a strong local mission statement with an emphasis. Because every group of people can find something special to do within the Great Commission that that group of people's good at. Some groups focus on perhaps world missions. That's their thing. Some groups focus on benevolence. Some groups focus on preaching and teaching. It's just how that group is at that particular moment, the people that are there. But there's a strong local mission statement and an emphasis. Number three, the members are are owners, not consumers. That you are a part of the congregation, you are not picking what congregation you want to be a part of. There's a huge difference there. That members are owners. Members are invested. Members are the congregation. They are not consumers looking for which congregation meets their needs best. Then also we have relevant and meaningful worship. Number five, prominent and positive image in the community. People know you. They know how you act, how you behave. Number six, they bring in new people rather than promote the same people. That there is this reality of wanting to grow. A reality of wanting to see new people do great things. And then number seven, these congregations systematically reproduce good leaders instead of negative leaders. They systematically, and that means purposefully, they have a plan for this coming. And they work that plan to produce good leaders instead of negative leaders. We also see that these congregations use technology Well, 
These congregations are where people consume information. Just a few years ago, if you wanted to have a gospel meeting, all you had to do was put an advertisement in the local paper. How many people read the local paper anymore? We consume media online. And if you want to reach people, you have to reach them where they are. They're online or they're face-to-face. And hopefully we can use the online technology to get them in a face-to-face meeting. Here are some things that everyone agrees doesn't really work. You can draw a crowd this way, but you can't build a church this way. Gimmicks, fun without faith, an overly seeker-sensitive approach to the church, an attractional model of worship, and then liberal approaches to Scripture and doctrine. Whenever you see groups that give themselves over to these things, these groups repeatedly die. In other words, this doesn't work. This is not really helpful. You can draw a crowd, but you can't build a church like this. These churches repeatedly die. So then the question becomes, are you ready to grow? Are you ready to grow? Are you growing now? Are you meeting people and having opportunities to talk with them about the gospel? Do you know people well enough to talk to them about Jesus? Are you growing now? Will you keep growing or will you grow if you keep doing what you're doing now? Now That's sort of a scary question, isn't it? Because the state of affairs is that many, many congregations are closing their doors. post the coronavirus, this has gotten much, much, much worse. We see with great rapidity congregations closing down, selling their properties because there's just no one there. What are we going to do? What's going to be our future? God has given us a role to play here. If you'll look with me in Ephesians 4 just a moment, I think we see a model for church growth through church health. One of the little slogans that has been effective, popular, and seems to have been proven right is that healthy churches grow. Healthy churches grow. Just like Krispy Kreme. Now, there's nothing healthy about Krispy Kreme. But just like Krispy Kreme can't help to grow, you can plant one anywhere and it'll do well because it's so good. The same principle then holds true for churches. Healthy churches grow. So let's look here in Ephesians 4 and see what makes for a healthy church. In Ephesians 4 and verse 1, Paul says, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord, notice first of all the humility of leadership. Paul doesn't start out by saying, look, I'm an apostle, you have to listen to me. He says, look, I'm a prisoner for the Lord, and I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. There is a life that you are expected to live. You're supposed to live like Jesus lived. You're supposed to model His life. You are supposed to model His holiness. You are to walk in a manner worthy. Not to fit in with the sinners around you, but to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have been called. What does it look like, Paul? Humility, gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look there in verses 2 and 3. Those verses are relational. Those verses are relational. He says, church, if you want to walk worthy of the gospel, if you want to be one of these healthy churches that are growing churches, you need to be able to get along with one another. You need to walk together with gentleness, with humility. With love. He says there in verse, in verse 3 that we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Not eager to spread gossip. Not eager to spread slander. But we are eager to maintain unity. Unity is a very fragile thing. Unity is very delicate. I remember several, several years ago, there was an individual that said to me one day, she said, You know, sometimes I just like to stir things up in the church just to get things going. Don't ever be like that. Don't ever do anything like that. That's horrible. That's the absolute wrong thing to do. Instead, you pursue unity. Now, here's why. In verse 4, 
The Bible says that we have to be united together because there is one body. There's the one church. And there's one spirit. The spirit who teaches us is one with God the Father, God the Son. There's the one spirit that we are to listen to. The one spirit that leads and directs us through His Word. This is our authority. There is the one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, you see, we're all going to the same place. We're all hoping, expecting heaven. And then he says in verse 5 that there's the one Lord. There's our one God. There's one faith, not many faiths, but one. There is one baptism. And one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. If verses 2 and 3 are highly relational, and I think that they are, verses 4 through 6 are more vertical. They're up and down. In these verses, we have an expression of God's authority where He is saying, I'm telling you what you must be. I am determining who you are. I am saying, this is the life that you are to live. These are the things you are to believe. These are the things you are to teach. And these are the people that you are to get along with in this mission. So verses 2 and 3, relational. Love, be gentle, be meek. Verses 4 through 7, vertical. God says this is the way it is. Now there we have a two-pronged approach for unity. That we are to gather because we are so gentle, because we are humble, because we love one another and we're forbearing with one another. We can work it out together. But then also, number two, because God has worked things out for us. Here are these boundaries. Here's your mission. Here's what you are to do. You are to go forward just as God said. So there's some room to work, but there's a clear mission statement. And there are clear regulations for the way that we are to treat one another and for the way that we are to reverence God. But as we get here to verse 7, we see that this grace is given to each one of us. You see that we're not just to be together and love one another, but in verse 7, the Apostle Paul wants us to see that we're actually supposed to be engaging the people around us. And he says, The grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Think about all of Christ's gift. They're all amazing, aren't they? And so how was grace given? It was given in an amazing portion. But here the Apostle Paul, when he uses the word grace, is not talking to us about unmerited favor. Here this word grace pertains to the ministry that we're supposed to be involved in. You see, that too is an unmerited favor. It's a gift that we don't deserve, that we get to be involved in ministry. And Paul uses this word grace either to talk about our salvation or what we're supposed to do as saved people. Here in Ephesians 4, he's talking about what we must do as saved people. And he says that grace was given to each one of us. Not to some of us. Not to 10% of us. Not to five people. But he says this grace, this ministry, this work is given to each one of us. According to the measure of Christ's gift. According to the overwhelming awesomeness of God blessing us, He has given each and, each and every one of us a ministry. Something that we're to do in the church. Therefore, it says in verse 8, When He ascended on high, He led a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. Now, what we're looking at here in verse 9 has to be explained a little bit further. So he says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, here's what happened. He is saying that he ascended because he first descended in the lower regions of the earth. The lower regions of the earth is a phrase that has to do with the realm of the dead. That Jesus went into the realm of the dead and now he has ascended and given gifts in this context ministry to people. So what we're looking at is that Jesus has descended into death itself, defeated it, and in his ascension, just like a returning, conquering general, at his return... He is giving gifts to His people. What are these gifts? These gifts here are in verse 11. And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we be no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. How? In love. Notice two things. First of all, what did Jesus descend into the realm of death and then ascend to give us? Here, ministry. Now then look at what that ministry is. If you look at each and every one of those offices that Jesus went to the unseen realm of the dead to give us, each and every one of those offices has to do with teaching people the Bible. Every single one of these has to do with teaching people the Bible. Jesus descended into the realm of the dead. He ascended so that what? You can teach people the Word of God. Isn't that incredible to think about it that way? Teaching the Bible is not a secondary issue. That's why Jesus descended and ascended again. So that the Bible can be taught. Then look at what happens when each member is working properly, as the Bible says. Here in verse 16... The Bible says that when each member is working properly, in this context, when they're all teaching the Bible, look what happens. When they're all unified together in doctrine, when they're all unified together relationally, when they're all using their unity to teach the Bible, what happens? Verse 16. When each part is working properly, that proper work then makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. How is it that churches grow? The Bible gives us an answer. The Bible says that they are united together relationally. They are united together in doctrine. And they appreciate that Jesus died and rose again so that they could share the Word of God. And as they are all sharing the Word of God, what does the church do? It grows. Why? Why? Because the church then is sharing the Word of God. The church is growing. The church builds itself up by sharing the gospel. But then there is this in love. And that can't be missed. Because everything that we do has to be done in love. Do you know why people want to be around you? It's because they know that you love them. It's the same reason you want to be around people, isn't it? It's because you know that people love you. Do you know why people will listen to you when you talk to them about Jesus? It's because they know you love them. It's because you, they know that you care. It's because they can see that you're walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. It's because they can see that this congregation is gentle, building itself up, caring, bearing with one another. And then they can also see this devotion to truth, devotion to the one God, to the one faith that He's delivered over to us. So church, do you want to grow? Do you want to do great things for the Lord? It starts with loving one another. It starts with loving God. It continues as we share the Word of God in love. That's how it works. That's what the Bible says anyway here in Ephesians 4. And I trust the Lord that wrote this book. And so if He says that's the way we should do church, I believe that's the way we should do church. And if He said that we can come unto Him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and that He would give us rest, I believe that with all of my heart. If He says that we can, even though we're sinners, that we can come to Him in faith, repenting of our sins and being baptized so that our sins are forgiven, I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that He is great. I believe He will bless us. I believe He is gracious. And I believe that He is powerful enough to bring out the promises that He has given. So 
So why not then take advantage of it and be saved? Why not then come in faith and obey the gospel? Why not then become a Christian? But once you become a Christian, you remember that these are your responsibilities here in Ephesians 4. To love your church, to love your God, to submit to His will, and to be devoted to teaching the gospel in love so that the church grows, so that other people enjoy your blessings, and so that God is glorified in your work. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, or tonight if you need the prayers of the church, won't you come now as we stand and sing? If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if His care has been constant and tender and true, the light of His presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell of gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of His presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If your faith in the Savior has brought its reward, if a strength you have found in the strength of your Lord, if the hope of a rest in His palace is sweet, Oh, will you not, brother, the story repeat? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of His presence has brightened your way, The souls all around you are living in sin. If the master has told you to bid them come in, if the sweet invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheer bringing word? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? Maybe say the And we thank everyone for their presence tonight, especially our visitors. We invite you to come back and worship with us every opportunity that you have. I have just a few announcements before we conclude our worship tonight. Funeral services for Jimmy, Ray, Jimmy Wayne Robertson, Nathan Robertson's father, were last Sunday. Please continue to pray for this family in the days to come. And I have a note of thanks to read uh, from Nathan's family. Thank you for the love and support shown during the loss of my dad. So many of you sent texts, called, or attended the services. The pottery sent by the church was beautiful. Knowing that so many people were praying for us made the process a little easier. Love, Nathan, Lindsay, and Noah. And let's continue to remember Nathan and his family as they go through this time. I want to remember Timmy DeBoard as he recovers from knee surgery. He's doing a lot better. And uh, here with us tonight, I think, starts rehab uh, pretty soon, so continue to pray for his recovery. Donna Schmitz is at home recovering from back surgery and hope she's doing better uh, today, so um, please continue to pray for her as well. Lisa Morrison will have shoulder surgery tomorrow in New Albany, so remember her as she goes through this, and Marley Kate Wallace will have her tonsils taken out Friday, uh, so please remember those in your prayers as well. Uh, Lucas Robertson, grandson of Jeff and Wendy Robertson, got a good report on his uh, blood test this past week. We're so thankful for that. Lucas um, was here this morning, and we're so glad to see him and, and glad that he, he got a good report. Jody Criswell, Wanda Orman's brother, has a blockage in his heart artery. Attempts to put in stents have not been successful. Please continue to pray for uh, Brother Jody and, and his family as they go through this difficult time. 
We received a thank you note from Pineville Children's Home thanking us for participating in their fall pantry drive. And we thank everyone that uh, brought uh, the items that they requested. Uh, now on Christmas Day, two weeks from today, we will have one worship service. It will be at 10.30 a.m. There will be no Sunday school. There will be no evening worship on Christmas Day. We'll have one worship service, and it will start at 10.30 a.m. There are a couple of sign-up lists in the foyer, one for communion preparation and one for help in the nursery, if you would like to participate in either one of those. And also remember our family fellowship meals on Wednesday night. We'll no longer be doing those in December, but we'll pick that back up in January. Also, teacher rotations will take place January the 1st, so that'll be coming up in about three weeks as we start the new year. On our fruit baskets uh, will be delivered this evening after services, and we want to encourage everyone that would like to participate in delivering the fruit baskets, please meet us in the fellowship hall uh, so that we can kind of divide up. We've got some uh, groups, leaders already selected. Uh, we've got the places that we want to go, and just as many as we that want to come and participate, go and, and see these folks and um, sing a few Christmas carols we would love to have you to come. If you'll meet us in the fellowship hall, we'll, we'll uh, divide up, get in our vehicles and, and go out and take the baskets and, and bring maybe hopefully a little Christmas cheer uh, to some of the folks that, that are unable to get out. If you're here this evening and were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, it is prepared. Uh, you may be able to ex exit the auditorium and during our closing song if you'll go to your right, it's the last room on your left. Someone will be there to assist you. Cole will uh, lead us in our closing song and be followed by our, our closing prayer. Our closing song will be number 659. We'll sing the first and last verse. If you'd like to stand, we'll have our closing song and closing prayer. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my Be with us now as we depart. Be with us and watch over us. Christ's name we pray.